it's really good to see uh, so many faces. And uh, earlier on the screen, it was great to see uh, people zoomed in. So welcome, uh, whether you're at home, whether you're here in the building, it's really good to see you all. And uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I hope you had a really good Christmas. And uh, I don't know about you, maybe you've been thinking about New Year's resolutions. I'm a, I'm a big believer in those, but I'm a believer in uh, achieving those resolutions. So I think for me, I like to keep the bar quite low. I'm probably going to get a haircut and see at least one film uh, at the cinema, at the cinema, so that I can look back at the end of 2022 and know that I've really, I've achieved what I set out to achieve. And that's important. I think that's important. Um, it's a good time at the beginning of the year to, to, to just pause and think about where we are on our journey with God. And uh, something Dave said earlier, he, he read out at the very beginning of the service from Exodus and uh, read out what Moses sang, actually, but the song of Moses after the Israelites had crossed the desert as they were about to enter the promised land. And that's a very good, uh, very good picture for the journey that we are on with God. So the, the Bible splits itself into the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the Old Testament deals a lot with this journey that the Israelites went on out of their slavery in Egypt and into the Promised Land. And the Old Testament uh, really is a, a picture of God's dealings with humanity before Jesus. So God chose a people, the Jews, he rescued them out of slavery, he established them in their own land, Israel, made a nation of them, gave them a series of laws and animal sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, and then sent them prophets throughout the, the next several centuries that would point the way forward to God himself becoming a man. And then the New Testament deals with that incredible event, God becoming a man, Jesus Christ. And whereas the previous animal sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins had to be repeated and were really for the Jews, Jesus Christ's death and resurrection provides payment for the sins of the world forgiveness of sins guaranteed through the act of jesus christ god made man jesus christ and if you've never submitted your life to jesus christ today could be the day or perhaps you're just not sure where you are on your journey with god perhaps you have submitted your life to jesus christ but you're just not sure where you are on your journey as we go through today and we're going to look at this journey that the israelites took and we're going to look at the parallels that that gives us if you've not submitted your life to Jesus Christ, or you're not sure where you are on that journey, please speak to me afterwards. I'd love to pray with you. So today we're going to be looking at this amazing journey that God used Moses to lead the Israelites from slavery across the desert and into the promised land. God described this as a good land, bringing them into a good land. And God uses that journey, as we'll see, to speak to us as God leads us in our life with him. So when I was, uh, when I just left university sometime in the last century, um, I went with my brothers. I've got twin brothers who are two years younger than me. And we went in our early twenties to Egypt and we stayed for a week in Egypt, looked at the pyramids, went to Cairo. And then we went across the Sinai desert and we slept out on the top of Mount Sinai um, we caught a bus, a rickety old bus from Egypt down to Mount Sinai, slept the, slept the night there on the top of the mountain. It was quite an amazing um, experience to be in that very place where God had revealed the Ten Commandments to the Israelites while they were halfway through their journey. And then came down the mountain in the morning, there was a rather surreal taxi rank, which meant we could catch a taxi across the Sinai Desert to Israel. So we had that advantage. But what we could easily see was that the Sinai Desert is a really hostile place. It's really rocky. It's blazing hot. It's mountainous. It's really inhospitable for humans. And if we weren't, you know, able to use cars and buses, you know, the idea of thousands of families being led out of Egypt across that desert would just be an undertaking that's just going to blow the mind, you know, God used Moses to take this 
large group of people across this desert with its rocks, with its snakes, in the intense heat. It's an incredible journey that God led them on. We should never underestimate how hard it must have been for the individual Israelites trusting in God that he would rescue them and take them to their, to their destination. So why were the Israelites on this journey? It all started some way back when Moses was tending sheep in the desert and he saw a bush, a flaming bush, and God spoke to him from out of this bush. And God said to Moses very specifically, said, I know the sufferings of my people, the Israelites. I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And off the back of that promise, that vision that God gave to Moses, Moses was then sent back to Egypt to perform these incredible signs and wonders to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelite slaves go, let them go so that they could journey across the desert. Thing is, for the Israelites who had bought into this vision, they were expecting to come to a country flowing with milk and honey. And in, in, instead, what they got was the desert I described to you earlier, inhospitable, boiling hot, rocky, dry, no water. They believed that they were going somewhere wonderful. And instead, this is what they got. And in fact, it became such a hard journey that at times they wanted to go back to Egypt, the place where they had been slaves. But God provided them with food, provided them with water, shelter, and a great leader in the form of Moses, who could continue to lead them to their final destination, this promised land. And God used their hard circumstances during this incredible journey. He used those circumstances, difficult though they seemed, he used them for good. He shaped their characters and ultimately molded a nation that, as I said earlier, would enable him to become a man and dwell in their midst. But he used the difficulties that they found on that journey for great good. And in the, on the eve of their entrance into this promised land, Moses has assembled them all. And Moses has a message for them, which we'll look at now. And Moses knows, God has told Moses, that there's a real danger that as they settle in this new land, they start to forget God. As they become comfortable, and rich, sleek, with many things that God has promised to give them, the milk, the honey, the other benefits of living in this incredible land of Israel. God knows that there's a real risk that they will forget him. So let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. If you've got a copy of the Church Bible, it's on page 180. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 11. So Moses is addressing the assembled throng of these Israelites who've been on this incredible journey. And he says to them, starting at verse 11, chapter eight, Deuteronomy, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So God knows how fickle humans are, that in the hard times we complain and grumble, and in the good times we forget God who gives us these blessings. And yet he still loves us. 
and still wants to know us. And the New Testament has a lot to say about this episode. Paul, when writing to the Corinthians, he says explicitly, he says, these things that we've just looked at, these things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction. So when we start thinking about parallels, this isn't some kind of airy, fairy, modern day cleverness. This is rooted in Paul himself recognizing that God bringing the Israelites out of Egypt through that perilous journey has real lessons for us in the way that God leads us out of our old lives and through with him to our final destination. So the, the, the main thing I suppose that we would draw from that speech that Moses gives to the Israelites is you shall remember the Lord your God. And of course that's crucially important for us that we remember the Lord our God. In a way everything else stems from that. If we're remembering the Lord our God then everything else will fall into place. No matter how hard it might seem, no matter how difficult things are at, at times, if we remember the Lord our God, things will work out. It's a guarantee. But of course, we don't always remember God. And the other thing, of course, is that we sometimes remember the wrong things. We're very good at looking back with rose-tinted spectacles to things in our past that we perhaps wish we could still be involved with, even if we know they're not uh, pleasing to God. And there's nothing wrong with being comfortable. Moses doesn't say to the Israelites, you should stay uncomfortable, you should live in harsh conditions. He doesn't say that. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable. God wants to bless his people. And we see that very clearly as they settle in the land. God blesses them as they follow his, his commandments. That's his covenant that he's made with them. But what he does say is that we mustn't forget God. And we must remember that we are only at our temporary destination. Where we find ourselves now is our temporary destination. What's the point of forgetting God when he blesses us, when this is not the final destination for Christians? It makes no sense to start relying on the blessings that God gives us. We need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. That's where we're going. That's the eternal guarantee for us, not our current system of blessings and material possessions. It's a temporary destination that we find ourselves in. Let's not get too, too attached to it. I'm reminded of a, a time many, many years ago at a company I used to work at. We, we had a scheme with a, a school in a quite a deprived area of London where we would go and sit with the children and read with them once a week. And I, I and my, a colleague of mine would do every other week with this particular child who I'll call Jack. Um, and we would go every other week and sit with him during lunchtime help him read. He was six and he hadn't had the best start in life. His home had no books. Um, it sounded like he had quite an unsettled home life anyway. So we would sit with him and just help him read, uh, read the, these books so that he could get up to the level of, of, his, um, of, the, of, the, of the other children in the class. And um, he was clearly a bright child. He seemed to think I was quite dim, even though I could clearly read better than he could. And it was only after several weeks that I realized why he thought I was so dim, because he couldn't differentiate between me and my colleague. We did look similar in our suits and ties, and we also had similar glasses, um, similar height, and to a six-year-old child, you know, we were the same person. So I would be saying something to him, and he'd be like, that's the opposite of what we said last week. Or I would bring a book, shall we try this book? we did that one last week so he clearly thought I was someone that had no retention anything he told me I'd start from scratch ground zero every week and it wasn't until several weeks went by that he realized there were two of us and things were a little easier then it wasn't always me it was me and my colleague and he could look at our faces and realize we were different people it's a really nice little boy but one of the things that really stuck with me was we were going through a book about nature and he was struggling with the words and it was describing waves crashing on a beach and he, he literally couldn't read these words and I was trying to help him just guess you know what happens on a beach you know and he didn't know and it turned out he'd never been to the seaside it was just a foreign land to him he had no idea so he'd grown up in this part of London that's fairly deprived never been to the, to the seaside and uh, there's a charity called Chicks which stands for uh, taking children to the seaside, um, <laughs> which which does exactly that. It's um, it's something like 
country holidays for inner city kids, that's right. Um, and the, the idea of this charity is they, they, they take children from you know, inner city areas who, who have never seen the seaside, never been out of London, and they take them to the seaside, an activity holiday. It's a brilliant idea. And you can just imagine they're on the coach, they're very excited to this you know, unknown destination. They don't know what the seaside is because they've never been there. And uh, the coach has to stop at the petrol station for a leg stretch. The children are allowed out and there's a playground just next to the, play next to the petrol station, which of course they enjoy playing on. And then they won't come back on the coach. They're having a great time at this playground. And how ridiculous that would be to leave them there, even though they're having a nice time. They've got to get back on that coach and be driven to the seaside for this incredible activity holiday. And if we're not very careful, that can be our experience. We get so bound up in the blessings, but also the difficulties of where we are right now in our lives, that we fail to keep our eyes fixed on the end destination, on Jesus, who's leading us, guaranteed leading us to a better place, a final destination with him. And we can help each other on this journey, you know, to remember God. It's something we do when we meet together. Even today now, we are remembering God. This is what we're doing. We sing to him. We praise him. That's remembering God. When we pray to him, when we read our Bibles, even when we're thinking about him, that's remembering God. So we've talked about remembering God and how important it is to keep him focused in our minds. But the other thing that we need to avoid doing is what I've called romantic reminiscing and that's not in the Hollywood love story sense but that's when we look back on our lives and we remember episodes which seem fun seem exciting sometimes we know that they weren't of God but they stay with us and sometimes we end up thinking about those reminiscing about those things and that's exactly what the Israelites did as I said they wanted to go back to Egypt at one point let's turn actually to uh Numbers 14, which is on page 143 of the Church Bible. Numbers chapter 14, on page 143. And it says, all the people, I'm going from verse 2 of chapter 14. All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And clearly they were not happy in Egypt, they were slaves. But because of the difficulties, they, difficulties that they now find themselves in, being in Egypt seems like a good option because they're thinking about the food, the water, the shelter, and they're, they're missing that. And I think there could be parallels in our own lives. You know, you might even have some in your own minds right now, things that you remember from your past. Sometimes you even dwell on those things. I know this happens to me things that were fun, things that were exciting, sometimes intensely exciting. And when things get humdrum, they come to the forefront of our mind and we start dwelling on them and perhaps wishing that we were back there. We know that God has rescued us, but we're still not quite where we thought we'd be. So we know that we're on this journey with God, but where are we on that journey? It's not where we want to be. And so things from our past can become very enticing. I remember when I left university, again, sometime in the last century, um, I was finally sort of confronted with the absolute reality of God. I'd always known he probably existed, but I'd lived my life up until that point, hoping that he didn't, trying to pretend he didn't. And suddenly a series of experiences occurred just after I left university, which meant that I knew beyond all doubt that he was absolutely real. And... I very quickly lost contact with most of the friends I'd made at uni. Um, our lives started to move apart. It was very difficult to still do the things that I'd been doing. Um, I had to give up lots of things. I became very miserable. I would share the gospel with people at work. I was convinced it was true, and I was absolutely ready to follow God no matter what, but I was really miserable for about 12 to 18 months. 
just really unhappy. I was having to, you know, kind of change gear without the clutch. It was horrible, uh, a horrible time to live through. But because God was so real to me all of a sudden, I didn't really care for the very first time in my life. I didn't care how I was feeling. I just wanted to do what I knew he wanted me to do. And there was loads of things in my life that were completely wrong and sinful, and I had to get rid of them. But it was really painful, really hard. And as I said, I, I didn't feel I was a very good advert for Christianity at work because I was very you know, vocal about this thing I discovered. I thought all my colleagues would immediately become Christians too because it seemed so real to me. But but I was also very honest with them, and I did mention to them that I was crying a lot at home, <laughs> so, which is true. I lived on my own. I got this lovely new flat, which I was so looking forward to moving into. You know, my friends were going to be so impressed. In the end, it turned out to be a complete tomb, and I hated it. Um, but I was so convinced that God was real, that it was worth going through that utter, utter dejection to, to just follow him and know him and get to know who he was, no matter what. But the one thing I did find hard at the time was letting go of this stuff and not dwelling on it because I knew that I did know how to be happy. I knew how to make myself happy. I knew how to be excited. I knew what to do to have a good time. And I had to stop those things. And dwelling on them was really tempting and, and not helpful at all. And I think fast forwarding to now, I mean, you know, there's so much online that helps us to dwell on the past. We've got Facebook, we've got LinkedIn. You can look at people's photographs from your past and you can imagine what might have been but didn't happen. And that's dangerous. It's really dangerous. You need to be focused on God. We need to stop our romantic reminiscing. It's not healthy. Our journey starts now. No matter where you are on that journey, it restarts every morning with God. And the other thing to remember is that the things we are looking back on are not realistic, you know, they're little snapshots of fun and excitement. You can't build a sustained, happy life on those memories. Even if we could go back in time, it wouldn't work out for us. Let's be realistic. Let's recognize that these are just memories. They don't represent reality at all. What is real is here and now. Our brothers and sisters, Jesus, God, our destination. Those are the reality, and they're great. They're really good. Don't let us be blinded by regrets or reminiscences. And I think, in a way, I was very fortunate because I'd, I'd made such a mess of my life that I was completely humbled. I had no pride at all. I was completely, I'd completely caved in. I realized that I couldn't live my own life the way I thought I could. And so I was very, very willing for God to just take over and do whatever he needed to do. And I found, as the Bible says, that God does lead us on this journey. I realized time went by and I was just getting better and things were opening up. I met Christians. I started, I found a church. You know, things just started falling into place. And I knew that God was with me and that what I'd read in the Bible was happening to me. And that was a great encouragement, a very, very great encouragement. And I think the thing with the past is that it's fixed. It happened. It's secure you know where you are with your past because it's not shifting in your mind. It's a thing. It's a real thing. Whereas your future is not fixed. It hasn't happened yet. So it's insecure. And so we have this tendency, I think, to dwell on the past because that's where our security lies. It's an actual thing. Whereas our future is not a thing and therefore is an insecure root in our minds. And so we need to trust God. This is where faith comes in. It's trust. Not because we just shut our eyes and pretend it'll all be all right, but because we know that in the past, God has been faithful. Therefore, logically, we will put our trust in him and know that he will be faithful in the future. So how do we live out our journey with God? The Holy Spirit is such a key part of this journey. The Holy Spirit is... The person of the Godhead dwells in us and keeps us encouraged, keeps us with God. And also the Holy Spirit helps us as we struggle not to remember these romantic reminiscences I was talking about just now. Let's just quickly turn to 2 Corinthians, which is on page 1151 of the Church Bible. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10. One one five one, and I'm going from verse three of chapter ten. For though we, what Paul is saying here is that yes, it's a struggle, and yes, we are in a battle, but it's not a battle of flesh. It's not a battle in the physical realm. It's a battle in the spiritual realm, and that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, and that's what we need to recognize that we are in a battle, but we're on the winning side. And Paul says, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And this is the key point. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So that line there, we take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's a God-given command to us, to take every thought captive, and that means it works. God doesn't tell us to do things that don't work. This works. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you take every thought captive, and you'll find that it works. I can testify to that. And Paul, in general, is someone that we can learn so much from as we go through this journey with God. He was imprisoned for the gospel. He suffered for Jesus, and yet... In his letter to the Philippians, which I would highly recommend reading, it's very short, he says, whatever I, whatever I previously had, I now count as nothing. Indeed, I count everything as loss for the, super, for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So his, his, big, his big thing was knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. And I find Paul so helpful because his instructions to us are not written from some sort of academic theoretical perspective. Paul is someone that suffered for the gospel. Paul is someone that knew Jesus, met with him after he rose from the dead. So we know Jesus through the writings of his physical disciples, Matthew, Mark, John, and others. We also know Jesus through Paul, who met with Jesus not on this earth, but only after Jesus rose and ascended to heaven. So that gives us a completely different perspective. Paul is a man who suffered hugely for the gospel. So he's not talking to us from a position of advantage or prosperity, although he knew what it was to have plenty. He's talking to us from a position of gritty reality, following Jesus, and yet continuously joyful. So what does Paul say to us about our lives? What practical help does he give us? How can we grow into God's peace? Peace is something we all yearn for. The peace of God is a phrase we read a lot in the Bible, which is a real thing. It's not, a, it's not an instant uh, benefit that you get when you become a Christian. It's part of this journey. As we seek to follow God and his instructions for our lives, so we move into his peace. We find that living life his way results in peace. And Paul says in Philippians, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. This is a man who was in prison when he wrote this letter. He's sitting there saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And then here he's warming to his theme, and he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul recognizes there that there's a process in place here. It's a journey that we're on. And as we follow Jesus on that journey, so we, we grow in a sense of peace in our, in our very inner being. No matter what our circumstances are, things can be turned upside down in our lives. But if we're close to God and we've been following him, then we sense peace in our situations. And Paul himself, writing from prison to the Philippians, displays such peace, such compassion for others, you know, his, his concern is for the people he's writing to, even though his own circumstances look really difficult. On Christmas Day, Dave was speaking to us from uh, Luke chapter 1, and right at the end of chapter 1, in verse 79, there's a part of the prophecy about who Jesus will be. And it says that he will guide our feet into the way of peace. So Jesus guides our feet into the way of peace. And again, a way is a journey. There is a way of peace, a journey of peace. It's a process. It's not a one-off. 
It's not something we can gain through meditating or trying very hard or simply asking God to give it to me now. It's a process. It's what God gives us as we follow him. Paul also addresses another aspect of the Israelites' journey when they're grumbling against Moses and they want to return to Egypt, just like we sometimes grumble and feel that we would like to be in a different place. Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. So he's quite hard about this. Don't grumble. If something's right, then we should do it without grumbling, even if we don't want to do it. And if something isn't right, then we shouldn't do it. But either way, grumbling is not an option for Christians. And Paul knew, as I say, how to live in plenty. He knew how to live with very little. He was imprisoned. He was beaten. He received like official beatings from the authorities. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. This is a man that went through, I hope, far more than any of us will have to go through, and yet clung to Jesus was passionate about Jesus and experienced peace in all these incredible situations he found himself in. And that's for us. The Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit. That's for us. And then, if you like, Paul's secret, he, he recognizes that God uses our suffering to bless us. This is radical stuff. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5 on page 1119. Romans chapter 5, page 1119. I'm reading from verse 3 in chapter 5. And Paul here has been saying, you know, we, we have been saved through grace. That's a done deal. We are saved. But then he goes on to say in verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So character produces hope, and character is formed through endurance. I think Daniela read something out earlier from Thessalonians, which talked exactly about that. Paul, again, in another of his letters, talking about endurance. It's part of being a Christian, and God's Holy Spirit helps us to endure these situations and not only to endure but to be blessed through them and to be changed in them so that we become more like Jesus. So we've been looking so far at the Israelites coming out of Egypt, out of slavery, a real journey for them through a very hostile environment to this promised land where they were going to be blessed by God. And we've seen that there are many parallels between their physical journey and our journey through life how we need to remember God, just like they needed to remember God, how we need to avoid looking back and regretting things, because our journey and our plan in God starts today. The plan that God has for your life restarts every day. You can't deviate from God's plan for you. It starts again every single day. All you need to do is turn back to God, and God's plan is right there. You're in his plan right away. The moment you turn back to God, it's there. And of course, the land of Israel wasn't their final destination any more than a physical location is our final destination. So what is our promised land? What's the equivalent for us? Where are we headed? And John, one of Jesus's disciples, we referenced just now, sees a glimpse of our final destination in Revelation, which is this incredible book, the last book of the Bible, where John has been granted all these revelations from Jesus himself, explaining what's going to happen in, in the future when the world comes to an end and we find ourselves in a new heavens and a new earth with God, directly with God. Let's read from chapter 21, Revelation 21, on page 1233. This is what John sees, Revelation 21. John sees this in a vision and knows that it's real. It's a real representation of what's going to happen. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, 
adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. So what do we do in the light of this promised destination? We know we've got this destiny. It's where we're going. But how does that help us now? How does that affect us now? And really, it's all about faith, that we choose to believe that this is what God has for us. God says it's true, so it is true. This is where we're going, an amazing place that we can't even imagine. It's so incredible. This is what we have to look forward to. Regardless of the physical world around us now, regardless of the hard times we go through, regardless of the blessings that we get, we have this sure, certain destiny that we're all going towards. Everyone who puts their trust in Jesus is headed to this incredible future. We can trust God because we know that he's been faithful in the past, in our own lives and in the Bible. We can, we can know for sure that God is faithful. And so we can put our trust in him for the future. We know it'll happen because he said it will. And he's been proven time and time again to be trustworthy and faithful. And faith is simply applying certain things that we know about to uncertain things in the future. And that's a biblical definition of faith. In Hebrews, it tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And that's based on knowledge of what God has done that we can then look forward with certainty to the future, knowing that God is true and God is faithful. And that puts everything into perspective for us. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. So in tough times, let God work in us through our circumstances. Let him do that. And in good times, make sure that we remember the Lord our God. And we as a people of God are on this journey together. It's something we're doing together. It's been such a blessing for me and my family being a part of this church these last couple of years. I love being a part of this church. And we're on this journey together. God is bringing us into a good land together. We can encourage one another as we journey together. We can encourage one another from the Bible. We can encourage one another in our difficulties. For that, we need to know each other. So we've got to get to know each other. We can encourage each other to look for God's hand in all circumstances. This is encouraging. We can be loving towards each other, accepting each other, just as Jesus is loving to us and accepts us. We can give each other loving feedback as we seek to grow more like Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Let's not shy away from giving each other feedback. It's a great privilege to be in a family where you can tell each other things that perhaps others wouldn't in love. And we can, we can grow in our, our journey as we help each other and encourage one another. And, you know, Paul summarizes this so well in Romans, another passage in Romans. Let's finish by reading that together. Romans chapter 15. Romans 15 on page 1128. That we're on this journey together and it's something we can encourage each other on. Uh, chapter 15, reading from verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you so much that you lead us on this journey. Thank you, Lord God, for encouragements you've given us in your word of other journeys you've led other Christians on and other people of God and we can see the beginning and the middle and the end and thank you so much Lord God for the destination that you you have for us Lord I pray that you'd bind us together as a people of God Lord that we would help each other on this journey encourage one another 
And thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us. We are so, so grateful, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was just wonderful. Wonderful to be brought back into alignment with the plumb line of Scripture. Just to have God's word brought with such clarity and with godly authority. I just did me no end of good listening to that. And I think I may well go back and listen to it again. So, so very helpful. I, I trust you found it encouraging as I did. I just wanted to... Um, uh, just to say something as we draw things to a close we've got a wonderful opportunity in these coming days in terms of praying together as Dave was outlining earlier and I was just reminded of the wonderful verse in uh, Isaiah 40 and I think we've experienced it this morning we've experienced exactly what it describes because it says here famous verse even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted and babies shall fall asleep on your shoulder but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, forgive me, some of you have heard me say this before, but uh, I remember many years ago, I was uh, on the, the downs outside Brighton where people do hand gliding. And, uh, and I was, I saw a guy at the top of the hill in his hand glider, you know, kit and had his thing. And, and I thought, okay, he's going to launch any minute now, you know, because you could see them flying around. And I thought this guy's going to take off and he didn't. And he just stood there and I thought, oh, come on, mate, we were waiting for you to do this stuff. You know, it could go and take off. It's just like exciting to see you lift off. And so I was kind of thinking, when is this guy going to get on and do it? And he just wouldn't. And eventually I went over to him and said, are you going to take off? Because, you know, not in that impatient tone, but I was like, are, are you going to do it? You know, I was, I was eager to see you take off. And he said, I can't, I can't just go. I have to wait and see the birds down in the valley catching the air currents. Then I know that the air will lift me. I've got to wait. I can't just chuck myself off. I've got to wait. And he said, when I see them lifting, then I'll know that's the right moment. And he just had to wait. And then eventually, you know, we went off and did something. And then eventually I saw, oh, there he goes. And off he went. And he, and he, and he took off. And, and that really helped me understand this verse. Because it says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. And eagles don't flap, they soar. But they have to wait on the air currents. And so for an eagle to, to fly that glorious way requires waiting and then catching the air and going up. Now, why do I say that? Because when we come to pray, we are coming to wait on the Lord and his strength will come to us. And I just want to encourage you as we gather to pray online in these coming weeks, if we wait on the Lord, we will be made strong. That's what will happen. We will be strengthened. But the problem is that often we come, give it a few minutes, didn't take off, didn't lift off, didn't feel anything, nothing changed. And so we think, oh, and we just, we just kind of slope away and we think, oh, it doesn't work. But no, it works for those who wait on the lord so i want to encourage you come along to these prayer times and if it doesn't fill you up with instant delight wait don't think oh i gave it five minutes this morning nothing happened or i was there or i was there for day one two three four you know and, and i didn't notice anything well the bible is the word of god and it says to those who wait on the lord they will renew their strength we can guarantee that if we prioritize waiting on God, we will be made stronger as a church. Okay. I don't know about you, but I really want to be stronger. You know, I really want to be strengthened. It will happen as we wait on the Lord. 
Okay, now that doesn't mean I'm going to be checking up on you or anything as to whether or not, you know, obviously the 6.30 prayer meeting isn't the only way that we do that, but it's one way we can. So I encourage you, if you want to be made stronger, if you want this church to be stronger, let's wait on the Lord in prayer. And if it doesn't immediately fill you up with joy and excitement, hang in there. Let's wait on God and he will strengthen us. We will be made stronger as we do this, just as I believe we've been made stronger by what Andrew shared with us this morning. Okay, so I just want to urge you to make it a priority, recognizing it will be, it's not just, oh, we're doing this to show up, it's this is to strengthen us. This is going to make us stronger. So let's give ourselves to, to doing that. Let me just pray and we'll finish. And just, you wanted to add anything? I'll pray you and if you wanted to add anything. Lord, we thank you so much for the glory of what we've heard, that you are a God who we can remember. We can remember your faithfulness to us. We can look back and see it again and again. You have rescued us. You have been faithful to us. We thank you every day is a new opportunity for the plan to begin afresh and we get to trust you again. We thank you. You've got a future, a glorious future ahead of us. Lord, I pray, help us to come to you, to wait upon you and find that your strength comes into our lives. Help us as we give ourselves to this fresh season of prayer and seeking you. May we be made strong, we pray. Strengthen and help us. Thank you so much, Lord, for all that you've done this morning. We bless you, Lord. We pray, help us to follow you with all our heart and soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a cheat day.